the most basic thing you can do as an ally is hear someone out and listen to them. And that's not what she did. Hello, and welcome to If Grapes Could Talk, your one and only source into the corrupt lives of wine country's elite. And who am I? Who were Dominic Fapoli's biggest supporters in Windsor politics? Well, those and many others are secrets I will happily tell. But before we begin, I would like to remind you that this series is about real corruption and real people, and we'll be touching on some disturbing themes. Today, specifically, we'll continue to be touching on the theme of sexual violence as we cover the case of Dominic Capoli. And while I won't be going into any specific allegations in graphic detail, today I will be discussing some of the recurring techniques that he used in the alleged assaults. This time, I also will actually be borrowing the phrase grapist, a term that I found on Reddit. Because I never was more than a prospective member of Active 2030, I never went on to like pay dues and be a full member, I really didn't have as much behind the scenes information as I do about the town of Windsor where I was a small business owner for three years. Editing right here. So I'm gonna make this two episodes cause there's a lot. And even last night, I was still finding more that I'm scrambling to incorporate. What I really tried to do in deciding what to include in this episode is I try to include what the public has expressed interest in, both to me behind the scenes, but I've also looked at written public comment to Windsor Town Council, and I listened to the April 14th, 2021 meeting where the public discussed the allegations against Papoli and how to make him resign. So here's the previously on Grapes Good Talk that you need to know for this episode to make sense, alleged serial press Predator Dominic Fapoli resigned from his position as mayor after Farah Abraham became the 13th woman to accuse him of sexual assault. And yes, that is Farah Abraham, star of Team Mom. You need to know that he was a member of Active 2030, number 50, which for the purposes of this, this episode, you just need to think of as an old boys club. And that the way that the Windsor Town Council used to work is that the town council actually decided amongst themselves who becomes vice mayor and mayor. And so two things about that history are important to note that in 2018, Dominic Fapoli was appointed mayor and then he won that first ever Windsor mayoral election. While I personally think that as far as town council members and town employees are concerned, there definitely is potential for accountability beyond just Deborah Fudd. She is definitely a figure that the community seems really concerned about and sees as particularly allied to Dominic Fapoli. Here's a public comment from, from someone, a resident of Windsor, I don't think it really, really matters. As a 15 plus year resident of Windsor, I don't trust either Dominic Fapoli or Deborah Fudge to ask that they be removed from town council. The timing is perfect as we are already having a special election and can appoint the two highest candidates to council. From there, Esther Lemus can become our mayor since she had more votes than Fapoli in 2018 and was passed up by Deborah Fudge for Dominic as mayor, which should not have happened in the first place. Let's get into the real reason you're here. <laughs> I'm gonna put some hard accusations on the public record about a group of ladies who lunch, is what I'm gonna refer to them as, who are protecting Dominic Fapoli from the allegations that were following him everywhere he went. While I'm sure that there are more women who are part of this coalition, I'm gonna focus on the ones that I knew personally. Councilwoman Deborah Fudge, Windsor Wonder Woman, Karen Alves, former Windsor Chamber of Commerce CEO, Laureen Romero, founding Windsor Town Councilwoman, former Rotary Club president, and actually my former landlady when my family owned Images, Maureen Merrill. I think it's the president, but it might be chairperson of the old downtown Windsor Merchants Association, Lori Shimizu. <laughs> I realized I forgot to mention that Kathy Green Cully of Casey's Diner should definitely be included in the ladies who lunch. I just kind of forgot about her because she's just so on another level. Um, but I will definitely be explaining what I mean by that in part two. As far as just like examples of things that are true about some combination of these women, you could very easily verify just by looking at their public posts is that one of them officiated the other one's wedding. One bought the other one an Apple Watch. They post pictures of each other in silly outfits. They write happy birthday on each other's walls. And I'm going to be talking about all five of them. The key three 
that wielded enough influence that they actually could have done something about Fapoli are Deborah Fudge, Karen Alves, and Maureen Merrill. To be perfectly honest with you, based on the dynamics that I observed, Lori and Lorene, not to say like they have no agency in the situation, it's just kind of where they are in the totem pole of Windsor politics. Given my focus on like hold the people at the top most accountable, they're just like not quite there. And to be clear, what I'm alleging, accusing, whatever, is that these women have absolutely no excuse for their behavior. They have, they may have been in such denial that the accusations could be true that to them it really did feel like they were doing the right thing. But the fact of the matter is they had all the information necessary to do the right thing and they didn't period. All that matters. A key facet of my evidence is their close connection to Amy Holter, pictured here escorting Dominic Fapoli to meet teenage girls. And yes, I am going to keep referring to her as a grapist beard until we come up with a better term for woman who allows herself to be a consequence shield for alleged serial predators. I actually didn't mention in the Act of 2030 episode, because I forgot, that's just how much stuff I have, that not only was she a member of 205, she was a president. So for context, I step into the story around 2016. My family took over images on the Windsor Town Green, the beloved jewelry store where so many of you got your children's ears pierced. I, I talked a little bit in um, the very special episode about this. Yes, I, in owning a small business and being in a position where my family could take over a small business, I was very lucky. I mean, that is a lot of privilege that I was able to do that. There's a huge difference between a cute little store like Images, where, you know, I'm, se I'm selling sometimes just like $10 little ear studs and Fapoli type privilege. And I'm sort of laughing at this now, but I think like that's important to note. Like one of the things that made Images valuable to purchase was that in moving back to Windsor, this would set me up to make connections with the ladies who lunch. And that was something that was explicitly stated to me. And there was a very structural built-in tie to the ladies who lunch through Maureen Merrill, who was my landlady. But I mentioned the economic disparity between myself and someone like Maureen Merrill, who owns commercial property in Windsor. It genuinely felt as though those women collectively could put me out of business and run me out of town. I mean, again, one of them was my landlady. She could just not renew my lease and that would have been horrible for business. So I move back, I take over the business. I'm, you know, sort of getting introduced to the ladies who lunch crowd. They seem nice enough. And so I decide to reach out to Karen Alves, who, you know, again, just seems like a very nice, welcoming customer. So around October 24th, 2016, I had the coffee date with Karen Alphys. Also, um, if you'll note in this Facebook message that I'm kind of using as evidence of around when this conversation would have occurred. Note just above it, Karen saying, I love you and your family. I was raised by lesbians. You know, when people say like, I love you and your family, very often, and that was the case here, that's someone's way of trying to signal to me that like, they're my ally. I was very much receiving that vibe from Karen where she wanted to be my ally as a marginalized person to help empower me. Oh, and I realize like referring to her as Windsor Wonder Woman is a bit vague, but she's like the very prototypical lady who lunch, <laughs> lady who lunches, who just like, I'm sorry if it sounds rude, but just kind of like a busybody who has her hands on everything because she's rich enough where her hobby can just be controlling everyone's lives. She has her hands in the Windsor Education Foundation. She has her hands on the school board. She has her hands in Rotary Club. She has her hands in the Windsor Farmer's Market. She may not be an elected official, but she's hugely influential in Windsor. So I was shocked to learn about her support of Dominic Fapoli, especially because I, at that time, was kind of taking her at face value as someone who might be my ally. And the most basic thing you can do as an ally is hear someone out and listen to them. And that's not what she did. She just shut me down like before I could even get two sentences out. And the way she shut me down before I could even finish just made it clear that she'd heard these allegations before and had already made up her mind. She didn't think the situation was dire enough to explore further. Her defense of her support for Dominic Fapoli was twofold. One, kaboom, 
The 4th of July fireworks show, Active 2030, is instrumental in putting on and actually making profitable. And then the other defense that she invoked was Amy Holter. <laughs> Seen here promoting Councilwoman Deborah Fudge's small business with alleged serial predator Dominic Fapoli. And despite this huge, huge disagreement, right, it was clear disagreement about politics, she continued to impart her political will on me. For example, on November 6th, she shared this op-ed from Maureen Merrill onto my Facebook wall, again, Maureen Merrill being my landlady, where Maureen was endorsing Bruce Okrepke and Deborah Fudge, and those were two of the Poli's strongest political allies at that point. I think it's fair to say that Deborah Fudge was a really big fan of the polies at that point, given this post where she's gushing over the red carpet wine tasting he gave her. So the only way that I could get Karen to leave me alone was to finally disclose to her that I actually couldn't vote in winter elections because my house is like technically like 200 feet outside of town limits. It's very annoying. Karen's motivations for defending Fapoli are fairly transparent. One, she is a public representative of Windsor and is therefore very invested in maintaining its family values image. Let's revisit again this family values Windsor woman propaganda. I'd like to add that it's a lot easier to find this, this is on the Town of Windsor website, than like stuff that would help a citizen who's like trying to be informed, like stay on top of what their city council people are doing. And that part of the site is incredibly difficult and frustrating to navigate, but you know, look how nice this looks. And the other motivation is money. The easiest example for me to go over right now is her ties to the board of the Windsor Education Foundation. Although she's not on their website anymore, I'm not sure exactly what year this is from, but as you can see, Act of 2030 number 50, which Dominic Fapoli was a member of, donated upwards of $5,000 to the Windsor Education Foundation. And Amy Holter's number 205 club gave somewhere between 1000 and 2500 And looking back on all of this, I really regret the way that I let Karen Alves shut me down. I don't think it would have gone anywhere. I really don't. So I don't live in regret in that sense, but I could have done more. I could have tried harder and I do have regret in that sense. And all of this really was a factor in my decision to leave Windsor. No LGBTQIA person that I know born in Windsor still lives there. And this, this leadership, they created the culture that drives us away whether they want to admit it or not. So on November 20th, 2017, Jane sent the 2017 letter to then mayor Deborah Fudge. Key context here, while Jane was the one to write the letter to Deborah Fudge, she was on a group trip. And the two other names that are going to come up as I read from the San Francisco Chronicle are Jamie and Anne. The subject line of this email was Dominic Fapoli. Wasn't pulling any punches. Now, I'm not going to read the detailed quotes from the letter. That's upsetting to me as someone who interned at a rape crisis center. Like I have, as you might even be able to infer from the fact I made this series, a really high tolerance for talking about this stuff. But in general terms, it was a variation on the theme of plying people with alcohol until they were too drunk to consent and then attempting to have sex with them. And I'm just going to say this now so that you're kind of listening for it. But the main difference between my response to hearing the allegations and these people's response to hearing these allegations isn't that they didn't believe the allegations. It's that they didn't think that the sexual assault of drunk people qualified as sexual assault. You know, as someone who was binge drinking in Act of 2030 at the time, I know they don't see it this way, but the writing on the wall was that they were saying, I deserve to be sexually assaulted. Or like, if one of these people sexually assaulted me, then I deserved that. And that's a really key example of where our leaders aren't listening to why we're really mad. They're trying to hone in on these very specific things that they can nitpick, when it's just like we're sitting here saying like, we're mad you didn't take us seriously. We're mad that you bought into these old fashioned values that women who drink are somehow less than other women. But I do wanna read some other quotes from the letter that I think can give you a better sense of what was going on for Jane, the woman who sent it, as far as her motivation. She said, I cannot stay silent when a molester rises in social and political rank. 
And then she goes on to say, I hope this information informs any decisions that are made regarding the scope of his role and his access to women. And I would argue that Jane was particularly brave because of the way power structures particularly marginalized her as an Asian LGBTQIA plus woman. The three women say they did not contact police in 2013 because they did not believe they would be taken seriously. Jamie and Jane, who have since separated, are LGBTQ and were in a same-sex relationship. In her recent statement to the district attorney's office, Amy noted that most of the guests were Asian women. We did not report this to police at the time because back in the early 2010s, as one can remember, I can remember, the attitude towards women when sexual assault happened was perceived almost always as the woman's fault, even though it was absolutely not. Dominic Capoli is a privileged white cisgender heterosexual man, and we were a group of Asian women. Who would believe us? So, upon receiving the letter, going back to reading from the Cron, Fudge said these officials, meaning the town manager and lawyer, apprised her town council colleagues who were then Sam Salmon, who's now mayor. Let's talk about consequences. Ooh, you knew about the grapist in 2017? Let's make you mayor. And Bruce O'Krepke, the guy who made Fapoli commissioner in the first place. And Millen, who like, isn't worth my time, but at no point looks good in this whole thing. And what this means is that at this point in time, they were aware of the fact that it was alleged that Dominic Fapoli used alcohol as a grape date drug. They were aware of that. They are responsible for how they chose to not respond to those severe allegations. And they do a lot of finger pointing about who specifically might have dropped the ball. I don't care. The 2017 letter was sent. There was no investigation. They haven't apologized for that. But you know what they did do? John Jansons, who was the town manager at the time, found it pertinent to warn Fapoli. And then Amy pops up in Deborah's inbox with a character defense letter. So here's what Amy had to say. Dominic is fiercely dedicated where it counts, wrote Holter, explaining how Fapoli was a role model for his nieces and nephews. This is all to say that Dominic is not the stereotype that so many people make him out to be. He is a complex person who is truly interested in continuing to grow and learn from others in order to serve the town to his greatest ability. And I find this fascinating. Amy wasn't exactly denying it. She was kind of denying that like, this was an indication that he was evil. I think we can all agree that that is a perspective that has done the opposite of aging like fine wine. Going back to the Kron's article about all this, Fudd shared Holter's email with Jansons and Donahue but said she was not requesting that they share it with other council members. This is from Dominic's ex-girlfriend. She wrote on November 26th. He told me they broke up a year ago. Which I guess like maybe she thought that was pertinent information cause like, oh look, Amy's doing this even though they're not together anymore, which <laughs> grapist beard. On December 6, 2017, behind closed doors, town council members told Fapoli he wouldn't be appointed mayor. They allowed him to remain as vice mayor, something then mayor Deborah Fudge deemed a huge punishment. Um, it sounds like you believed Jane and you just think that you had an appropriate response of making him just be vice mayor. <laughs> this punishment of only being vice mayor is even more insulting because they still made him mayor the next year, even though he didn't get the most votes. Esther Lemus, the person he went on to assault, did. And they had an opportunity to, one, like just like honor who the people of Windsor seem to like the most and appoint the first Latina mayor of Windsor. Like, again, Take responsibility for the opportunities you had to move Windsor in a positive direction and drop the ball. And the year that they went on to make him mayor, Maureen Merrill, my former landlady, former president of Rotary Club, founding member of the Windsor Town Council, she sent a letter to the editor of the Windsor Times endorsing Fapoli, and therefore I think like continuing to really drum up support for Fapoli's political career, despite the fact that Amy, Karen, Deborah, like people that Maureen chills with, like at this point from my perspective, you knew. <laughs> 
So here's how you know I had too much stuff. I forgot the 2018 Me Too allegations, which given that those were posted in a public forum and apparently made Dominic Fapoli's mother so upset that she went crying to him that he had to get it taken down. That's what I inferred from Dominic's Facebook messages to the accuser, which are available in the Quran. So that was yet again an opportunity where someone who prioritized the safety of young women in their community, despite their friendship with Dominic Fapoli and his lovely rapist beard, investigate what is now clearly at least a potential pattern of behavior now that we have the 2017 letter and the 2018 Facebook posts. While we're on the subject of the Me Too movement, and especially since this is so close to Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I would be remiss not to note, for those of you that don't know, that the Me Too movement is actually thanks to a Black woman, Tarana Burke. It's sad, alarming, but not surprising how few people know that, despite how much change I think the Me Too movement has had. Don't get me wrong, we still have a long way to go. Obviously, <laughs> what am I doing if I don't think we don't have a long way to go? All right, since we're in Fapoli's campaign years, let's talk about the complaints filed against his campaign in terms of like shady finances. Because I'm breaking this up into multiple episodes, I'm only gonna summarize the campaign finance complaints that are relevant to the main cast of characters that we're discussing today, aka Amy Holter, who is implicated in multiple complaints. There was a $2,000 payment to give to Amy Holter to give to a charity, which is odd. He made a $250 payment to her as a professional fee, which was suspect because it wasn't a campaign year, and she's his girlfriend slash grapist beard. And finally, there was a $1,000 $51.05 payment that was reimbursement for like campaign supplies and stuff, which was odd given the health guidelines at the time. And then there was a $195 payment to her that was suspect for similar reasons. And again, this is all publicly available, link down below. Whenever I can link something for you, you know I'm going to. Uh, I think this is the one that is particularly insulting to the people of Windsor. This is from the San Francisco Chronicle um, description of the investigation. In one disputed campaign spending report for the first half of 2019, Fapoli said he paid $584.55 to Sonoma Brothers Distilling for meetings and appearances. The office manager for the Windsor Craft Distillery said in an interview Thursday, Thursday that the payment was for bourbon and vodka that Sonoma Brothers supplied at a birthday party for Fapoli at Christopher Creek Winery on May 27th, 2019. An invoice provided to the Chronicle lists a Christopher Creek birthday event. Basically, the distillery is saying that it was you know, based on the way it was invoiced, it wasn't a campaign event. I was actually lucky enough to find a public post dated May 27th, 2019, the date that um, the distillery says the birthday party was by Deborah Fudge. <laughs> So it looks like Deborah Fudge was at the birthday party, Sam Salmon was there, Amy Holter was there. I'd also like to point out that James Gore is at that birthday party. Right now I'm focusing on Windsor officials, but once I shift to county, James is definitely someone I will be investigating further. And then if we look at the comments, Karen Alves, like, good food, good company, good time, good, 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 good. And then like, this part was just very high school vibes to me. Here's this guy who's sad that he didn't get an invitation. And then Deborah Fudge is stepping in to defend the poll and be like, oh, like he mostly invited people on Facebook. Totally legit campaign event, right? A key point about this birthday party and why it was important to me to mention that I had seen Dominic Fapoli pouring wine into people's glasses. So when I was in college, I interned at a great crisis center and we engaged in bystander training. I did have a sense of what kind of behavior to look for for evidence that someone was predatory. He was pretty open in terms of behaviors that were red flags for this kind of predator. And this predator has a prototype. Like he is a stereotype, it's, it's fine, you can call him that. If they were at a party and he was serving alcohol and these leaders had bystander training, they would have seen it. Had Karen Alves heard me out in 2016, I would have gone into all of that. And then I also want to mention that in um, this filing from July, where he used some of the 
$90,000 that he raised to make donations to Karen Alves's Windsor Education Foundation and Lorene Romero's Chamber of Commerce. So let's talk about his endorsements. As you can see here, the Downtown Merchants Association as the association endorsed him, which is incredibly shady because Images was still open at the time and my family owned it. Now at the time of this alleged endorsement by the old downtown Windsor Merchants Association. My family wasn't contacted about like if we were okay with that or not. And like, I don't know, but I suspect that part of the reason that we weren't consulted is because the leaders knew where we stood and knew that we would try to block the endorsement. And at this point when they endorsed Fapoli, they were aware of allegations against him. Right? Deborah Fudge had been exposed to the 2017 letter. I had spoken to Karen Alves in 2016 and she clearly knew. I also, as you can see, circled Bruce O'Krepke. He's on this website actually as one of the testimonials to Fapoli. The amount of upset that I feel when I see that he thinks Fapoli is a good representative of millennials. How dare you, Bruce? How dare you? Like, let us choose. Believe me, we wouldn't have chosen him. So November 22nd, 2020, so we're very close to April 8th, 2021, when the allegations like went on the more credible public record um, than just how consistent and clear and concise the allegations were as just individual citizens were trying to do what they could and bring what they knew to leaders in the hopes that they would use their privilege and their position to actually make something happen, which I cannot emphasize this enough, they did not. So... That was around the time that <laughs> Fapoli tested positive for COVID. And so I made a Facebook status calling him an embarrassment for that and for being an alleged sexual predator. Karen wasn't even the only one to step in and defend him. So Karen steps in and she says, if Fapoli is an embarrassment, then so am I. And I want you to really sit with the fact that this is the energy that these women would bring. If Fapoli is an embarrassment, then so am I. He turned out to be much worse than an embarrassment. So you don't get to cry like you never tied your image to him. So I made one last plea to Karen that, you know, as you can imagine, went nowhere. But hilariously enough, she actually like reached out to my mother to like get me to go away and be quiet. So that's Karen Alves asking to speak to my manager. Um, so I sent this message to multiple of the ladies who lunch. Though I want to be clear that I did not send it to Lorraine. Just because this I'll get into later. While I still disagree with a lot that she has said, she's someone who I think has had to to deal with a lot of deflected anger about things that weren't really her fault. You can believe me or not, but I wouldn't say anything unless they had seen and heard enough evidence to be 100% confident. Dominic Fapoli is a sexual predator. Pretty much every young woman who went through 2030 with him knows he's creepy. But sadly, many don't even realize that attempting to have sex with a woman who is passed out drunk qualifies as sexual assault. Make no mistake, watching such a man rise to mayor was 100% a factor in my decision to leave Windsor and to found my new venture elsewhere. And I'm not alone. I don't really care if you say I'm talking about this or keep it to yourself. I have nothing to be ashamed of. And this isn't too off base from what I was trying to tell Karen back in 2016. What seems to be a key distinction between myself and Dominic Fapoli's enablers is that they don't think the sexual assault of a drunk person qualifies as sexual assault. Yeah, so to illustrate that point, here's what she had to say. I find there is a difference between a reckless, entitled 20-year-old, ma'am, he's... 38, partying too hard, making very bad decisions, and a sexual predator. She advised me that I was exhibiting a victim mentality as well, and that I should put my head down, give up on, you know, these attempts that I was making to do something. But she didn't, like, she didn't say, put your head down and give up. She didn't see it that way. She called that standing tall. Harkening back to her calling him a 20-year-old in this comment, again, this was in 2020. <laughs> The poly was 38, so almost double the age of 20. And they've been excusing his behavior as youthful exuberance since he lied about his political resume in at least one of his early campaigns. Interestingly, in terms of apologies, she like she literally said, I know this will be upsetting to you, and I'm sorry. There was really nowhere to go from there, so we don't speak anymore. She doesn't care that she doesn't care. 
So in honor of Martin Luther King, I will be reading what I believe is a very relevant quote to this week's episode from Letter from a Birmingham, Alabama Jail. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And the key thing that most makes me feel like this relates to Windsor is that in their response, and where they are now. They're just trying to shove the controversy under the rug so they can get back to happy, normal, joy, joy, not recognizing that happy, normal, joy, joy will just lead to another Fipoli if we don't spend more time and effort really breaking down what happened. Look at the moments where these leaders drop the ball and figure out what we can do better. So later this week, I'll be releasing part two. I'm shooting for Friday, maybe earlier, maybe later. If you want to be first to know, subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. So until next time, you know you love me. XO, XO.